And, and, and the reason why we're calling it, we're going we're gonna to jump right into this. Um, how many of you guys know uh, that, that you want to make sure that whatever the last thing that you tell people, whatever the last thing you do, it just, it, it hits the hardest. It has the most impact. Um, so, for instance, let's just say that uh, you were in a basketball game. Anybody play basketball? Softball, soccer, any kind of sport, debate team. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, you may not know it by looking at me, but in my high school years, Yo Soy um, was a all-star basketball player. I was on the all-district team, the senior all-star team, um, averaged about 20 points a game. And uh, so that was me. So, so one season, we're playing in a tournament, and uh, the clock is at nine seconds. Nine seconds is a long time. Now I need somebody who, who knows how to play basketball. Who knows how to play basketball? Dominic, Dominic, come here. I know Dominic knows how to play basketball. I know Dominic knows how to play basketball. So so we're now 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 here's what you need to know about my, my senior year. Uh, I was the only returning starter from the previous year. And the previous year, we had gone to the championship game. Um, unfortunately, the rest of my teammates didn't show up, um, not physically, just mentally and ability. And uh, I was the only one who did well during that game. And uh, we lost uh, 48 to 92. But um, anyway, <laughs> let's just say this. Let's just say that their point guard was as tall as our center, okay? So um, it was tough. If you don't know what that is, the point guard is the one who dribbles the ball. They're usually the shorter person, okay? Their shortest person was tall as our tallest person, all right? Now, Dominic, I need to go over there like you're the out-of-bounds line. So I'm the only returning starter, okay? Now, because I'm the only returning starter, when the, when the game's on the line, who do they give the ball to? That's right. That's right. Nine seconds down. We got nine seconds. We're on this side. I need to score over there, okay? Get past half court. Nine seconds. Now, I need you guys to be the clock so you can kind of see how this went. No matter what, don't stop counting down. So let me hear you count down together. Ready? Nine. Eight, seven. Okay. So no matter what, you just keep counting. So they're about to pass it in. I go, juke them out. Ah. Five, six, seven, eight. And my coach said, Josh, get over here. You had nine seconds to get all the way across the court, and you shoot a half-court shot. And I was like, yeah, that was really dumb. I could have gone down the court, back again, and back again in nine seconds. Thank you, Dominic, for throwing that in. Your skills are unparalleled. Let me just say that uh, I did not show up in the final countdown. It's the final countdown. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. I did not show up in those minutes. But here we're going to show up in, in a garden. <laughs> feel a little disrespected. Jesus shows up in a garden, and we are going to talk about these last minutes, these last moments that Jesus has with his disciples. Let me show you in John 14. 30 and 31. We're going to see what Jesus is telling them. Watch this. It says, I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me. Next verse. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. So Jesus is with them. And he says, listen, I don't have much time left. He says, this is the final countdown of... Okay, we're get, it's getting a little repetitive. So what we're going to be doing is in chapters 13, 14, and 15, focusing on 15, we're going to see what Jesus thought was the most important, what he really thought mattered as we go into this. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be breaking this down. What did Jesus tell them in this new series? What's it called? That's right. Ben. I appreciate that. Thank you for showing me respect for this new series, The Final Countdown. 
Um, let's start in John 15, 1. I really thought you were going to do it. I did. I was, I almost thought. John 15, 1. Who has their Bibles? Who's ready to go deep? Who's ready to just like dig into the word like a, like a trowel full of cereal and just milk that has just been like poured in freshly. It's still crunchy, but a little bit soggy, but you're just like ready to just, you know, who likes soggy cereal? Who likes only crunchy? Who likes a little bit of both? You like it to go in between. Okay, whatever you like, that's what this is about to be. Let's jump into this. Father God, we thank you that you're going to do something incredible in these students today. Holy Spirit, would you prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Let me have you guys do this. Go ahead, put your hand, one hand on your heart, one hand on your head. One on each, one on each. Now pat your head, rub your, no, I'm just kidding. All right, say, God, help me to understand it, but then help me to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the final countdown. Uh, the final countdown. Let's start in John chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to talk through this discussion he has with his disciples. So I want you to picture, I want you to picture what's going on around you. Jesus is in a garden. It's nighttime. Jesus is stressed out. They probably have not seen Jesus stressed out Ever in the time they've been around him, every time something comes against Jesus, he's ready. He knows what he's about to do. He knows what he's going to answer. But Jesus knows that he's about to go through one of the worst deaths that anyone can go through. He knows he's about to get beaten and crucified and that the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, is about to get laid upon him. Now, I believe that he was actually stressing more because of that than because of the pain that he would go through. Because the sin that would be put on Jesus is what would cause the Father, Father God, to have to turn away from Jesus and say, the, 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 the payment that you deserve and I deserve is going to go on my son. The removal from my presence is going to go on my son instead of you. And so Jesus, who has never been separated from the presence of the Father, is about to experience that in this moment. And he's stressed. And so he's talking to his disciples. He's saying, listen, before I die, before I go into the grave, before I rise again, and then 40 days later, I'm going to leave. Here is what you need to know. Here's what it truly means to be a follower of me. This is, do you know, this is the only chapter in the Bible that is only the words of Jesus. The whole thing, just the words of Jesus. John 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Now, I thought about going and getting a grapevine, but I didn't want to get shot for trespassing on somebody's field. So I got a vine. Doesn't have any grapes on it, but let's just pretend. He says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Now, Jesus isn't using, like, random metaphors and allegories. He's not just like, hey, listen, you know, I'm the veterinarian and you're the pig. Like, he's, he, he's, he has a specific reason. Now, he doesn't just say, I am the grapevine. He says, I'm the what? True grapevine. The reason why he says this is because all throughout Israel's history, one of the things that they have been compared to is a grapevine. Israel, in the Old Testament, which is the first half of the Bible, that's the part of the Bible that the, uh, the, the disciples read, that's the only part they had, was the Old Testament. It would compare them to a grapevine. Look at uh, Psalm 80, verse 8. Watch this. It says, you brought us from Egypt like a what? A grapevine. You draw away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. So they have this understanding that they are a part of Israel. Israel is called the grapevine. And so they identify themselves with Israel. Their identity is found in their nation. Who they are. How they should act. The way they're supposed to talk. What they're supposed to believe. How they're supposed to dress. Everything that they know. Their whole identity is wrapped up in the fact that they are from Israel. They are a part of the nation of Israel. Back in the 1980s, when we were at war with Russia, uh, kind of like today. No, I'm just kidding. Um, back in the 1980s, we were at war with Russia, and American patriotism was like at an all-time high. 
because we had an enemy, we had a battle, and we are, we're Americans, American pride, and everybody stood up and, and put their hand over their heart when the, when, when, when the national anthem was sung. It was insane. It was crazy. We identified ourselves as Americans. That's who we are. That's how we act. And this is how they were. We are from Israel. That is our identity. We're a part of the vine. Well, here's the other thing that Jesus knew. Centuries before, there was a guy named King Solomon. Who's heard of King Solomon? King Solomon, super smart guy, he built a temple, the first temple that was permanent to God. So before that, they had like this big tent that they would set up and take different places, and that's where they would meet with God. Well, he created a temple. Now, this temple in today's standards would cost somewhere around $216 billion. Okay? $216 billion is about what this temple costs. Now, over time, because Israel rebelled against God and got taken in captivity, this temple got destroyed, and down the line, right before Jesus comes onto the scene, King Herod builds another temple. And what's interesting is that on the outside of this temple, historians say that there was a gold vine that was decorating the outside of this temple. You're like, okay, so what? The temple was the only place people could meet with God. It was the only place their sins could be forgiven. It was the only place they could connect with God. It was the only place where they could find the presence of God with them. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I am the true vine. I know you've identified yourself with Israel and that's your identity, but now your identity is found in me. I know that you connect with God at the temple, but I'm the true vine. Now you're going to connect with God through me. I am the true vine. Don't look at anything else. Don't look at sports to be the thing you, identi- you find your identity in. Don't look at your GPA. Don't look at how smart you are. Don't look at how pretty you are. Don't look at how, 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 how many girls you can get and how many guys like you. Don't look at how good you are at a video game. Don't look at how your parents talk to you. Don't look at anything to find your identity except for me. We will find our identity in some of the craziest things. We will find our identity in being weird. I'm just the weird one. Ha, ha, ha. It's like, okay, well. Like, that's cool. You can be. But I have to be. I ha- oh, I'm the funny one. Oh, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the loner. I just sit over here and nobody really notices me and nobody wants to talk to me and that's my identity. Or I'm the loud one. I'm the smart one and I know all the answers and everybody asks me and whenever they ask, I have all the answers to the questions. And I, We can find our identity in so many different things. We can find our identity in our friends. We can find it in our family. We can find it in our job, how much money. We're so many things. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Those are false vines. I'm the true vine. Find your identity in me. He says, you find your connection with God in me. It doesn't matter if you come to church. It doesn't matter how many points you have on your card. Doesn't matter how often you read your Bible, if you don't actually know me and you're just doing it to check off the box because that will make you a good Christian, that's what makes you look good in other people's eyes, then it doesn't matter. That's not how you find your connection with God by knowing me and all those other things. Church, memorizing scripture, the word of God are ways that you come to know me. He says, I am the true vine. Find your identity in me. Then he goes on to explain, this isn't just about like being a leech, right? You know what a leech is? It just sucks on, like just sucks. Or a tick. Ticks are gross. You know, if you get a tick, burn its butt and then it'll get his, yeah. That's that's just supposed to get you get a match, you light it, you you touch it on the butt and he's like, "Ah," and he backs out. All right. You're welcome. Let's go to verse 2. So he says, my, my, my father is the gardener. Then he says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. So he starts talking about what it's going to look like to be a follower of Jesus. He says, 
producing fruit is of utmost importance. He says if you're not producing fruit, you're going to get cut off. And you're like, wait a minute, hold up. Like, <laughs> like if I'm not doing good enough, he's just going to like lop me off. And it, it, it's not like that. You have to understand that in order for you to stop producing fruit, you have to stop being connected. See, you can have a moment and a time in your life, and I've seen it happen over and over again. People will come to 418, they'll start following Jesus, and they'll, yeah, I want to follow God, I want to follow God. And they do for a while, and then they graduate, and they get into college, and all of a sudden, church takes a back door, and, uh, uh, sorry, back, takes a, a, a back seat. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, you know what, I would come, and, and, and I would read my Bible, I just don't have time. I would do this, but I don't have time. And then they start getting other people's thoughts and the world's mentalities in there. Oh, Oh, yeah, well, maybe maybe God is, you know, maybe there are lots of different ways to God. Like maybe this is just one way. And then all of a sudden you start watching them shift. And they were connected to the vine, but then they're not. And they stop producing fruit. And I see it time and time again. This isn't just something where God goes, hey, listen, you're not doing good enough. I'm lopping you off. No, no, no. This is a, a process where we go, I am disconnecting myself from the vine. He says if you're not producing fruit, you're not actually connected. Now, how do you know if you're bearing fruit? That's the real question. How do you know if you're bearing fruit? Well, first of all, we have to define what fruit is. What is it that Jesus is looking for? First of all, and I want you to write this down. The fruit in your life is going to be being like Christ. It is going to be changing in your character and your attitude and your mentality from the way you used to think to how Jesus thinks. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it gives us a pretty good uh, reference point. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that God is producing. They are the fruit that he is producing in us. So you have to ask yourself, am I seeing myself become more patient or more kind? Am I, am I seeing the areas in my life where I'm not doing those things? Now listen, I'm not saying that you have to all of a sudden, you're following Jesus, and all of a sudden you just walk around your school, skippity-doo-dah, hop, skipping, and jumping around everywhere, and, and you never have a bad day, and every time somebody's mean to you, you just give them a stick of gum, and like, yeah, we love each other. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you are watching how you change and become more and more like Jesus. See, in, five months ago before Jesus, if they had talked to me like that, I would have went off on them. And I almost did. But the Holy Spirit's giving me some self-control, and I shut my mouth, and I walked away. A little while ago, if this situation would have happened, I would have been anxious. I would have been upset. I would have started overeating. I would have started just, just, just vegging out on TV. But I didn't because the Holy Spirit over time has been working more peace inside of me. He is bearing fruit. Now the other thing that this is, it's, it's seeing people that you know start to come to know Jesus. It is reaching people for Jesus and helping people find Jesus. This is fruit that you bear as a Christian because you are living for Christ. Now, what does he say? He says, if you're not bearing fruit, then he cuts it off. And if you are bearing fruit, then he prunes it. Now, some of you, I know already, you're going, how do we go from a grapevine to a prune? I'm not getting this connection. <laughs> I thought grapes turned into raisins, plums turned into prunes. Okay, but this is, this is a different kind of prune. Pruning is when the gardener knows exactly what to cut off because if you have too much growing on a vine, it will stop making fruit because it's trying to grow all of these things. There's extra things it's trying to grow that keeps it from growing the fruit it should. Um, there's this thing that happens with trees called a sucker root. 
all right? And what happens is a tree will grow, and a root from under the ground will all of a sudden go, I think I want to be a tree too. I want to be a full tree. Don't want to be under the ground anymore. And it just shoots up out of the ground, and it just starts growing like it's its own thing. It's like, yeah, I've got my own thing going over here. Thanks, bro. And it just starts growing. And what happens is all the nutrients that was needed for the regular tree will start being fed into this new thing. And it will kill the original tree trying to grow the new sucker root. So what gardeners will do is they will cut the sucker root away so that it's no longer trying to nurture that. The pruner, the gardener comes in and he goes, listen, I know you've been mad at your friend for about five weeks now. And you're not willing to forgive them because of that argument you had. But it's time to forgive. So we're going to we're gonna have to cut this off. I know that hurts. I know you have some friends in your life that are taking you in the wrong direction, and you need to find some new ones, but you're, you're going to you're gonna have to cut them off. I know you like to watch that show, but every time you watch that show, it, it, it traps you, and, and you go deeper into, into lust, and you go deeper into fear, you go deeper, and we're going to have to cut that off. And he begins to prune, not because he's mad, but because you're bearing fruit. You're, you're starting to grow. You're starting to mature spiritually. You're starting to become more like Jesus. And he goes, if you want to go to the next level, you can't have all this extra stuff hanging on. So I'm going to cut that off. Not because I don't like you, but because I love you. We're going to cut off everything that's keeping you from being like Jesus. And then you know what happens? We have a choice. We have a choice if we will let him prune us or not. This is, what, this is where it's different. This is where the allegory breaks down from we're the grape vine, we're, we're the branches, and we bear fruit, and he's the branch. It's because, guess what? A vine out there doesn't have a choice. They just go start chopping stuff off. But we have a moment where God says, this, you need to forgive this person. You need to choose to love this person. I know that your parents didn't treat you the way you should, but I want you to love them. That doesn't seem fair. I know it's not fair, but I want you to love them. I know that that, that teacher is always, always on your case, always, but I want you to forgive them. I want you to stop talking back to that teacher and represent me well. I want you to, and he is cutting things off. Why? So you can bear more fruit. Because let me say this, if you're in class and you are back talking your teacher, and then you go and tell your friends that you know Jesus and you go to church, they're like, wait, what? The same person with the bad attitude that just cussed out the teacher is the same person that just invited me to church? And your ability to have fruit decreases. You may be trying to get your parents to come to church. Your parents may not know Jesus. And you're like, hey, you should come to church. And they're like, you are the same kid that won't clean your room when I ask you to, gets an attitude when I say take out the trash, and, and you are the same kid. Why would I go to church? But when you start obeying and forgiving and apologizing and having self-control and discipline and allowing the Holy Spirit to change you, you all of a sudden have the ability to bear fruit. He prunes us. Then Jesus gives the secret to making sure that you bear fruit. Watch this. I love this. In uh, verse, verse 3. We're going to go three to six. He said, you've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. He's talking to the disciples. He's like, listen, I've already told you a lot of stuff. There's already pruning happening. You're not perfect, but you're already starting in the process. Verse four, remain in me. Let's read that together. Ready? Remain in me. This is the key. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Verse 5. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pause right there. He's not saying nothing. Like, obviously, you're like, I just twisted my hair. It's like, oh, Jesus, help me. Like, that's not... He's saying you can't bear fruit. You can't bear eternal fruit. What you want to do, what you want to accomplish, you can't do. You know what's weird? It's technically you can't do anything without him. 
He says that he holds the world together by his, by his words. Everything happening right now, he is holding together. Your ability to live, he's holding together. Your ability to think, he's holding it all together. We literally cannot do anything without him. But this is talking about bearing fruit. You can't do anything in and of yourself. Why is he saying that? Because pride can creep in. Oh, well, look what I do. See, look, Pastor Josh, look how many people I invited to 418. They came because of me. Actually, they came because you were praying for them, and God moved on their heart, and he drew them to himself, and now they're sitting in this room. But you were obedient, so that's fruit that he gives to you. Pastor Josh, I read my Bible three days this week and didn't miss a single day in those three days. I read them all, and look what I did. No, 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 no. God is helping you. He's empowering you. You didn't read your, your Bible for a whole month last month, and now you're excited about three days like you did it. No, the Holy Spirit empowered you because you are remaining in him. Without him, you can do nothing. Verse 6. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. So he's saying, listen. This isn't just about let me go to a church function, let me go to a youth group, let me do a thing, let me show up at church, let me say I believe in God, let me wear a cross necklace, let me have a cross tattoo, let me have cross earrings, let me say I believe in Jesus, read my Bible sometimes and say I'm not this, that, or the other. This isn't about that. This is about being a true disciple and bearing fruit. That when people look at your life, you may not be perfect, but each day you're looking more and more like Jesus than you did before. Each day you're learning to forgive. Each day you're learning to have peace. Each day you're learning to know him more, to remain in him. Remain means to live, to stay there, not to move. You stay right there. When you're struggling, you remain. See, sometimes we play this game, right? It's like There's two different ways that we play. Both are wrong. My life is great, and I'm having a great time, and God's blessing me, and my grades are good, my friends are good, my life is good, I made the lacrosse team, things are going so well, I'm going to church, God is good, and then... We lost a friend, and they stopped being our friend, and our GPA is low, and we don't understand the new economics class, and we did, and this is that. And we're like, oh, life is just so hard. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not reading my Bible anymore. I'm not praying. Because why? Because you were supposed to help me, God. You were supposed to make my life better, and you didn't, so I'm done. And then our life improves. <laughs> I'm back at church. Hey, guys, life is good. God loves me. And then there's the other one, right? There's the other one. My life is great. I'm not really sure why I need to go to church. I mean, like, everything's going good. Things are great. Things are not great. I should go to church, man. God, could you please help me? Like, my life is really struggling right now. And God, could you help me out? And then... And we, we can play this game where when it's good, we, we don't go to church. And when it's bad, we run to God. Or when it's bad, we run from God. And when it's good, we run to church. Either way, that's not how you remain. And if you don't remain, you won't bear fruit. And these are the people that you see. And you're like, I thought they were a Christian. And the farther down the line they get, the less and less like Jesus they look. I thought, huh, okay. Because they didn't remain. When I sin, I remain. When I fail, I remain. Sometimes, sometimes we will allow our failures and our sin to cause us to run from God instead of running to God. I messed up in that area again. I'm not going to run from God. I'm going to remain because without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I can't stop this addiction. Without him, I can't stop the fear. Without him, I can't stop being jealous. But in him, I can. So I'm going to remain. I'm just going to stay. When I go and I spend time with God and I hear nothing and I read my Bible and I don't understand it, I'm going to remain. When all my friends are, are at youth group and all my friends are there and, and, we, and I have a good time, I'm going to remain. When they're not here and they've gone and they've graduated, they're not here, I'm going to remain. It, 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 it's staying. And we're going to talk more about about 
what it looks like for us to remain. But the, the main thing I want you to take away from this message is this. Remaining is just not leaving. It's just staying. That no matter what you guys, my wife and I, and I would say the leaders in this room have gone through some stuff. You can look at us and be like, well, you don't understand what we're going through. No, no, you don't understand what we have gone through. But we've remained. When we couldn't feel God, we just stayed. When we felt like we were just messing up over and over and over again, and, and God was, was, God, why won't you not help me stop sinning this way? We just remain. God, why won't you take this pain away? We just remain. God, why won't you help me with this relational issue? We just remain. God, I feel sick. We just remained. We just stayed. God, I don't get it, but I'm not going anywhere. God, I don't understand, but I'm going to stay. And when we have that mentality, he says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. And when he remains in us, how does he remain in us? Through the Holy Spirit, through the presence and the power and the life of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, empowering us, changing us. Let me say this. One of the beautiful things about remaining is that you may not know that you were impacted and that you have grown fruit until you have come out of a hard time. You'll just stay and stay. And there will be times when you'll come to church and you'll come to youth group and you'll, and you'll come to, on a Sunday morning you'll be like, I don't even know why I showed up. You'll go spend time with God. I don't even know why I did it. I didn't get anything. Nothing happened. But three months down the road, six months down the road, you come out of this fog, out of this struggle, and all of a sudden you are stronger than you were before. You are braver than you were before. You have a power and authority through Christ like you never had before. And you're like, what just happened? You remained. And when you remain in him, he will remain in you. It is a beautiful thing. Let's, let, let's finish up. Verse 7 and 8. He says, if you remain in me, he switches it up a little bit. And my words remain in you. You may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Let me say that there has been some confusion over these verses, like nobody's been. How many of you guys have ever asked God for something and didn't get it? If I had three hands, I would raise them all, okay? I have asked God for so many things that I did not get. And you're like, then why did he say this? I want you to notice that, that, that he makes a little change here. He says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you. When we remain in him, we start bearing fruit. He starts changing our character. When his words remain in us, his words, his teaching, the, the, the way that God does things, the way that he processes things, the way that God is moving on the earth, when that is what's remaining in us, then we can ask for anything we want. Now, you have to understand that we are connected to the vine, and the vine is who? Jesus. Okay, you all said God, that's correct, technically, but more technically, it is Jesus. Okay, it's Jesus. Now, Jesus said this. He said, I only do the will of my Father. I only do what I see the Father do. So what Jesus is saying is when you remain in me and my words remain in you, as you become one with us, as you learn to think like us, as you learn to become, you will begin to pray the same thing my father is praying. And when you pray the will of the father, the answer is always yes. When you pray the will of what God has, the answer is always yes. Now, there's some things to this that I could go into that are pretty cool, but I don't have time to. And if you want to ask me about it, you can come ask me about it and I will tell you. But. The main thing I want you to know is Jesus is not lying. He's saying there has to be a shift in the way we think so that the way we think lines up with heaven. And we, see, Jesus came to earth to do the will of the Father. Jesus said the same way that God sent me, the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So did we come? Did he send us to do our own will? No. He sent us to do the will of the Father. So... 
What he's saying is, as you are operating in me and doing what I've called you to do, and, 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 and you come into situations, and he's not saying, okay, now listen, as soon as you graduate, you can ask for, uh, you can ask for a Porsche, boom, got it. Because you remain, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, as my word remains in you and you become like us and you become to, to understand the way we think and what we are doing in each moment. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you in each moment. Oh, this person is going through this situation. And, and they be saying, hey, listen, I, I, I want to get, get healed of this. And God's saying, that's not what I'm doing right now. What I'm doing right now is healing in their marriage. And we go, God, would you heal in their marriage? Boom, and it happens. Why? Because we're praying his will. And whatever we ask will be done. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, we're going to get into that more uh, on a different day when we talk about specifically remaining. Go to verse, uh, verse 8. When you produce much fruit, you are my what? True disciple. If there's a true disciple, there can be a what? False disciple. There can be somebody who looks the part, plays the part, acts the part, but they're not. How do we know? They bear fruit. They become more like Jesus. Sometimes, you know, you'll meet somebody. You ever meet somebody and you're just like your first initial response, like, they're great. That person's awesome. And then you get to know them more and you're like, they suck. <laughs> You ever had a moment like that? It's like, that person is horrible. What happened? They looked apart, but eventually you got to see the fruit. And the fruit was not good. <laughs> the fruit was not good. <laughs> Siri's over here want me to preach more than you guys want me to preach. Siri's like, say it again for the people in the back. So here's, here's my point. We bear fruit. And bearing fruit is the sign that we are a true disciple. Look at Matthew 5.16 because it says that brings glory to my Father. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Who gets the glory for the fruit that you're, you bear? The Father. He's, he's the one who's been working. He's the one that's been pruning. He's the one. You just remain. He says, and you will give glory to the Father. <laughs> the reason why we see the chaos in the world today is because there is an enemy that is fighting against and fighting for people's souls. He does not want them to know Jesus. He does not want them to, 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 to know that Jesus loves them and died for them and, and, and will save them. He does not want them to know. And so he will, he will just deceive them beyond anything you could imagine. And some of you were deceived also. But then all of a sudden, somebody talked to you. You heard about Jesus somehow. God broke through, opened your eyes, and you made it. I'm going to choose Jesus. And you begin to bear fruit. Why am I telling you this? Because your fruit, your good deeds, your changing into, the, into being like Jesus is what the world needs to see to understand that there's something different. One of the biggest lies I feel like that that social media does, that, that, that everything does, is that all the sin that people are uh, involved in is, is, uh, is actually making them happy. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't make them happy and make them feel good in a moment. I'm saying that they go home and they're like, man, I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm just enjoying life. This is how my life should be. Yeah. They're not, which is why Half of schools are on antidepressant pills and anti-anxiety pills and everything else. And they're cutting and they're doing drugs and they're drinking. Why? Because what they are doing is not fulfilling them. Because that's not what they were made for. They were made to be a part of the true vine. And when they see you, they get to see what it will actually look like to be a true disciple of Jesus. You can bring light. Go ahead and stand up. 
Here's my challenge to you. We're not going to do a big old altar call, have you come up to the front or anything. I just, I, I, I just, we're, we're going to get into what this actually looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Over this next series. And uh, if you've never decided that you were going to follow Jesus, or maybe you've been, you've been going to church for a long time, it's been kind of like just a thing that you do, kind of a game. Um, my parents go to church, I go to church, whatever. But you realize, wait a minute, if, if this isn't a real deal, I'll get, it says he will, I'll get cut off from the vine. And he said, that's, that's not what I want. I actually want to choose to follow Jesus. And so if you guys would just close your eyes for a minute. If you want to actually make a choice for real to follow Jesus, to make Jesus the one that you were connected to, that you find your identity in, the one who, you, who forgives you of your sin and you choose to follow. If you want to do that, would you just put your hand up real quick? If you, good, 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 good. Thank you, Jesus. To say, Jesus, I choose to follow you. I want it to be real. Not a game. Not about somebody else. I want to truly be connected to you. Forgive me of my sins. I choose to follow you. Now, if you said that and you meant it and you believed it, the Holy Spirit has come inside of you. He is making you new and he is now connecting you to the true vine and it is time for you to bear fruit. Now, for those of you who know Jesus or just decided to follow Jesus right now, here's the next thing. You now need to give yourself over to the pruning of the Father. There's going to be some correction. There's going to be some discipline. There's going to be some things where he goes, listen, we're not doing that anymore. And you submit and you allow him to prune you and you will grow. So let's just do this. Let's just open your hands up to God right now. And if you're willing to tell him, say, God, make me like Jesus. Cut away what you need to cut away. Even if it hurts. I know you'll help me. I want to bear fruit. I want to be a true disciple of you. In Jesus' name. Guys, I'm super, super, super proud of you. Some of you guys just tried to say that right after me. That's cool, too. Um, you're like, guys, I'm super, super, super proud. I'm like, what? Uh, <laughs> super proud of you guys. Uh, we're going to jump into uh, connect groups.